All right. Okay. So, hello, everyone. My name is Nikola Marincic, and I work as a lecturer at the Chair of Digital Architectonics and also as the doctoral program coordinator at the Institute of Technology in Architecture at ETH Zurich. So I'm taking care of around 50 students from six professorships. Um, what I'm interested in is the relation between our architecture and information technology. And my focus is on the challenges that AI poses to our field. So I believe that we should face these challenges through what I call digital literacy. And to, we should embrace the abstractness of computation. Because for me, computation does not belong to computer scientists. Computation is a new avenue for us to think and express ourselves and also to reinvent the architecture within the digital. I would like to introduce my research agenda. So uh, there are two parts of this, this talk. One is going to be my standard thing that I do, think I do well at least, where I'm very stable. Second part is going to be uh, 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 using the instrument that I developed in my research to see how how it works within a very contemporary topic that you can observe right now. Like if you go to the state of the art of the fascination with artificial intelligence, how can you use your research instruments to talk about it? So I'm not trying to claim here that, that what I will conclude about it is something definitive. I just want to, to explore it and to open it for discussion. So that we can, because I think that what I offer with my first perspective is maybe a more broad, broader view to explore the, the now which looks always like so immediate that it's very difficult to talk about it. So initially I got interested to architecture through the lens of design, but uh, my interest evolved uh, as I started doing research. And what I found more and more compelling is that architects work, whether it is, it is building a theory or a building, always involves integration of a wide variety of aspects that are actually outside of our area of expertise. So what we do is we integrate incommensurable things such as light, shadow, climate, heat, color, sound, materials, airflow, electricity, information, and waste, among others. And for more than 3,000 years, we have done this masterfully. And this architecture's ability to integrate what seems to be incommensurable into a coherent whole that is larger than its individual parts, this is what I call architectonics. On the other hand, an architectural model unifies and holds all these diverse aspects together. So unlike in sciences, the notion of an architectural model was never a formal notion. Yeah? So the involved architectonics had always been too complex to be described by some kind of axiomatic theory. Thus, the notion of an architectural model was developed in writing. So we have treatises. Uh, from Vitruvius, Alberti, Palladio, Boulle, Semper, Corbusier, Venturi, Kolha, Eisenman. And the development of digital computers in the 1950s, it invoked a unification across all fields of knowledge. So what used to be modeling in a field quickly turned into a computational modeling. And my question is, what happened to architecture? So my position is that this elusive complex architectural model described in books got fractured. So architecture's representational aspect became digitalized. So this CAD paradigm, it utilized computer graphics to mimic the traditional design methods within a simulation of Euclidean space. But almost every other architectural aspect, like thinking, theory, stories, inspirations, relations, all stayed far from computers for way too long. So my motivation as a researcher is how to reunify it, how to put it back, how, how to make, how to complete our architectural model. In a sense, how to introduce things that, that we are not used to seeing in computers, how to put them back, how to put architectural theory in computers, which sounds a little bit crazy, yeah? So to do this, I think we need to know how our modeling is positioned in relation to other fields. And in my doctoral thesis, I formulated an answer to that question, and I want to present it a little bit to you for you to better understand uh, my whole motivation, how, how do I approach this problem? This is a little bit, uh, yeah. I will maybe start, start uh, if, if you have questions, please stop me. So I want to start with this. So until the 19th century, it was a common belief for thousands of years that axioms of logic and geometry were the truths about our world. So when we look at Euclid, look Euclid's uh, axioms, 
or he called it postulates. It's di different people translated differently. They were meant to be at the same time two things: logical apparatus, so postulates which have which have a certain logical rule within the system of geometry, and on the other side they were truths about our world. So this was considered to be the same thing at the time. So everyone was very excited that we had this ancient science, which was kind of putting together reality and model, yeah? logic and reality together. Yeah? And in the 19th century, every science wished to be grounded with something as stable as these two things, as geometry or logic. And then something astonishing happened. So in 1829, Lobachevsky developed a geometry by appropriating the first four axioms of Euclid and changing the fifth postulate, which was a little bit tricky at the time because no one could actually see whether if this holds true or not. Well, Lobachevsky turned it from a true statement into a false statement, just which the, the truthfulness of that last statement. And he created something called a hyperbolic geometry. And this geometry, it describes a world that cannot be observed empirically. Yet from the logical standpoint, his construction was just as valid as Euclid's, completely as perfect as Euclid's, only with one small change. And this idea that axioms are empirical truths about our world started falling apart. And as you know that this is a crisis of, uh, of, of mathematics in the 19th century, a big crisis. And uh, some uh, mathematicians like Russell said, we do not know what mathematics is and what it is about, like completely losing the sense of what <coughs> mathematics is and like, what do we do with it? What is it then about if it's not about reality? Therefore, there was a need for a new idea to prove the trustworthiness of theories and knowledge systems. And this idea was consistency. And we can recognize two equally rigorous but ideologically quite distinct schools of thought that were interested in establishing consistency within knowledge. And the first group of mathematicians, including Frege and Russell on the left, had an approach based on formal logic. So they wished to establish a transparent unified system of foundations and to define the whole of mathematics from bottom up. So it's like a tree, bottom up, or like a tree having roots and then growing up, indefinitely covering the whole world, the whole knowledge. Yeah? This was their dream. This was their, not only dream, this is the attitude that I now, now want to push because as you can see, I, I uh, made a distinction between two sides, which I'll be keep pushing, maybe even sometimes artificially, just to, to hold an argument. On the right side, we have the approach of Bull, Dedekind, and Hilbert. It was, a, I would call it an algebraic approach or tradition. So what they taught, they thought of abstraction as an instrument to create internally coherent frameworks without unified basis. So they would consider a framework which starts from a kind of arbitrary sets of, uh, of uh, postulates, and they would not be caring whether this is some kind of uniform tree that covers the whole world, but it should cover the theory that they are pushing towards. So if they have something to, to, to say, if they have something to do in, in reality, they would create this as an instrument to play with, not as something which should be truthful to our world. Yeah? So completely different attitudes, which I would learn, like to, uh, to, to, to uh, keep separate. And this tentatively set up distinction between logicists and algebraists, it remains very consistent to describe events in the 19th and the early 20th century. And I think it can also very well explain where do we stand with architectural modeling. And the most notable effort in establishing consistency was the so-called Hilbert program, and it defined three main expectations of formal systems. I do not want to go into this. It's a little bit technical, and I think you, most of you know about it because uh, of what I'm going to say next. So. As the proponents of the logicist paradigm, so the, the ones who would be, be living in this tree, embrace the idea that actually this can be done. This tree can be built through this form formalism of Hilbert. Another earthquake happened in mathematics. And in 1931, Austrian mathematician or logician Kurt Gödel exposed the fundamental limitation of this bottom-up perspective. So he introduced a fundamental limitation of formal systems and showed that the first two requirements cannot be fulfilled, at least not at the same time. And then the punch line came from Alan Turing and Alonzo Church, who proved that the so-called Entscheidungsproblem has no solution. And as a proof, they both created a theoretical models of computation. So one was a, a Turing machine and another one was a lambda calculus. And this is how the computation uh, started being, how it was born formally that because of the links to this Hilbert program, the meaning of computation, so how people thought about what it is, remained colored 
by the stories of this logicist, remain colored by this story of this tree. Yeah? And I identify two dominant streams that have evolved from this logicist tradition, and they all impose their own interpretation of computation. They claim the computation is this or that. So the first one was about control and automation, and its most prominent representative was Wiener Cybernetics. As he says, it has long been clear to me that the modern ultra-rapid computing machine was in principle an ideal central nervous system to an apparatus for automatic control, yeah? And the second stream looked at the computation as mechanized grammar, so true language. And it gains prominence with Chomsky and continued with Lindenmeyer and Stein. And he says, there are two sentences, coralless green ideas sleep furiously and furiously sleep ideas green coralless. He says, sentences one and two are equally nonsensical, but any speaker of English will recognize that only the former is grammatical. So as you can see, the emphasis is on rules of the grammar, yeah? My hypothesis that all the prominent examples of computational modeling in architecture subscribe to either left or the right side. So I would position these two paradigms within the logicist tradition. What about computer graphics? Well, computer graphics was developed to provide a notion of space within computers but the field has limited itself to a simulation of a Euclidean paradigm, yeah? So in terms of model thinking, computer graphics are recreating this world prior to 19th century, where geometry's axioms are considered to be absolute truths. So what modeling went over, abstracted over, computer graphics is recreating back within the computer screens, yeah? For a pragmatic reasons. So architecture, unfortunately, embraced computer graphics as an infrastructure that settled it into intuition and certainty, only believing with what you see. So the abstractness of the employed mathematics that is used in computational modeling is utilized only as technical means to simulate this Euclidean space and these 2D and 3D geometric objects that are immersed in it, float in it, and which are indexed by the absolute notion of time, like New Newton's time. So this was a mimicry of the established modes of design which reinforced the old canon. So I would also put computer graphics to the left side. But CAD systems are not the only ones that pertain to logicism. So I would also argue that most of the computational models in architecture in the last 50 years also subscribe to either Wiener's legacy of control and automation or Chomsky's legacy of formal grammars. So you have recursive and grammatical models that are rule-based and adaptive models that are control-based. We have emergent and cellular models that are rule-based, and we have parametric models that are control-based. Just when you think about control, think about grasshopper sliders. It's a, auto, it's a system of control of the whole thing. You have control. You are the god with the sliders. You do, yeah. You create this world. Logical models, like Alexander's uh, pattern language, are rule-based, while generative are control-based. But what about this algebraic side and its commitment to abstraction? So what happened there? is that algebra, is, they ended up fully embracing probability theory. So in the 18th century, Bernoulli introduced this idea of expected value. In the 19th century, Laplace introduced the idea of variation from the expected value, which is known as this normal distribution <coughs> curve. And then in 20th century, we have Andre Markov, who created a theory which encapsulates the notion of dependent variables. So how things correlate when they are dependent on each other. So this Markov model is especially interesting for us because in 1906, it was considered completely useless by skeptical realists, like a nice game, but nothing significant. And then 100 years later, Google turned it into a computational model, which became this, the basis of its search engine. So Google search engine started as a Markov chain and completely changed how we think about information, how we search for it. Needless to say, the way how quantum theory models phenomena also relies entirely on probability theory. So as the famous American physicist Richard Feynman would say, to calculate the probabilities of an event is actually the only thing that the nature permits us to do. Yeah? Nature permits us to calculate only probabilities, yet science had not yet collapsed. However, there was another shift towards abstraction that was needed to make quantum physics and relativity theory possible. So this was a radical rethinking of the overall conception of space. Yeah? And in 1854, Riemann's theory on the right, uh, separated the notions of what we today know as topological and the metric structure of space through the concept called the manifoldness or manifold. And this paved the way towards a contemporary physics, made it possible to think about relativity. Without that, it's impossible because in, in terms of 
Cartesian space, you cannot think of, of, of relative, relative spaces, which in which the clocks are dependent. Also, quantum theory where the clocks are dependent on the observer himself. Yeah. Unfortunately for architecture, our architectural reference only uses this thing on the right to reinforce its commitment to Descartes and Euclid. So on the left, we have the Euclidean and Cartesian paradigm. And on the right, we have the Romanian legacy, which then goes into many things like global and local distinctions, Romanian surfaces, and covering spaces, which I don't have time to talk about. So finally, we come to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And yeah, AI models, they're of algebraic nature. They do not rely on any intuitive notion of space. They are not confined by the number of spatial dimensions. And they do not aim to mimic objective reality, although they could easily encapsulate it. It is a calculus and linear algebra-based infrastructure, which is devised to support an interplay of probabilities, which are directed towards a particular question, dissolving the notions such as reasoning and truth. So with a data set large enough for every single question, machine learning provides a more or less probable answer and everything can be object objectified. So this is my stance on the artificial intelligence. For that reason, I would put it on the right. So my hypothesis is that the architectural modeling remained within the logistics paradigm by remaining truthful to our intuitions that are embedded in a simulation of a three-dimensional world. So we are simulating the thing that our science abstracted over in the, 19, in the 80, uh, late 80, uh, 19th century. Yeah? And this hinders our ability to understand and embrace the generality and abstractness of AI, which is just not about that at all, as I told you before. So what I would like to speak about today is what happens if we collapse this distinction between, between these two sides. So I want to challenge why is it important to keep this distinction? What are the dan dangers of forgetting or never learning the nature of AI-driven modeling? So what happens when we use it to simulate objective reality? To, to, so to use AI to simulate the pre-19th century world and to reinforce our familiarity with it. So what happens if we use AI in a way in which we started using computer graphics in the last century? Yeah? To a world which is truthful to our empirical understanding of things and their foundations. So this is where the story of Narcissus might be a good metaphor. So Narcissus, as you know, he was distinguished by his beauty. And he ended up, at least according to one story, ended up falling so much in love with his own image in the reflection that in an attempt to get even closer to his own image, he drowned, drowned in the river. So in my opinion, the lack of understanding this abstract and alienating nature of AI also has a potential of redoing this story, retelling the story to us. So we are the beautiful narcissist and the AI is the river. So if we look at the AI with our eyes or ears, rather than with our minds, an image or a sound will seductively answer back to us. It will appear to us, back to us. And we may fall in love with this reflection. This is what my problem is with AI. So this is the GANs that we have. GANs are recreating us back, us back to us. I will later explain why and how. But we are seduced that we have, that we on the, our screen, we see people who look exactly like us, who sound like us, producing texts that look like our texts, uh, producing geometries that look like something we have models. And we are seduced, we are in love. But what we are in love with is, is this image of ourselves that comes back to these models. And I think this is what happens when we collapse things. And I think this is also the danger. Yeah, I think this is the danger of dr drowning. This is how we drown. If we really believe that AI is projecting back to us ourselves, then we will trust it to make decisions for us, important decisions. So we might trust the AI to tell us who should go to jail and who shouldn't get a loan. And AI will be 90%, 95% sure, and maybe even correct sometimes, who is a criminal. <coughs> but should we take the responsibility for this decision? So, and then we hear loudly that the problem with all of this is that our data and our models are biased. And we hear the loud experts that say, you should remove this bias. What is this story? This story is exactly the same story that happened in the 19th century with logicists and algebraists. Logicists use this formalization and symbolization 
to get rid of the biases of their, of their own time, which were called paradoxes. They were at any cost trying to remove the paradoxes to clean them away. They saw themselves as kind of righteous purgers of inconsistencies because they wanted to build this beautiful tree that is always correct. The same thing happens with bias guys today who are saying about ethics of AI. They want to purge the biases from their models, purge the biases from the data, make it clean so that we could have fair AI. Do you understand that this is the same story happening all over again? So logicists have failed officially on this, on this endeavor. And I think we should learn something from this failure that happened back then and do not try to uh, search for a fair AI. Because when you have a problem of bias in your data or in your model, this is not a problem of the models nor of data. This is the problem of you thinking that this model should be used uh, at all, yeah? So if a model is predicting that more black people should go to jail, it's not a problem of the data, it's not a problem of the model, it's the problem of you. Who, who, is, who is putting this model to use, yeah? So this is my, my stance, which no one, everyone is very, very disgusted with, which is also a problem for me. Uh, so how then to think about this relation of AI and creativity? So this is the part when I'm just using this, what I build upon to talk about contemporary things that we see every day and I'm not sure about it, but I will just use what I know to, to navigate through it. And of course, I'm open for discussion. I'm curious to see what you have to say as well. So my position is, so far, is that as long as we are able to keep this distinction between us and this mirror that is looking at us, we should be fine, yeah? But I think this is a super challenging thing to do today, to, to, to make this, this, to keep this distinction between yourself and the person looking at you seductively in the mirror, yeah? So I will now explore some phenomena that we can observe around this topic of AI and creativity and what is exciting about it in our culture. So I consulted Twitter. So here's a relatively recent tweet named Kowloon City in the style of Wes Anderson and shows this nice facade resembling a famous and now demolished uh, block in, in Hong Kong with colors which look like coming from Wes Anderson. So obviously the image is not real in a sense that it does not portray any real space. But in terms of the fidelity, it possesses some quite realistic features like shadows, materials. Obviously people who know Chinese, they realize that this is a nonsense. This is, these are not Chinese characters at all. Yeah, but if I don't know Chinese, for me, it looks very much like, like them, which is also a problematic thing. Here's another tweet from the 6th of February named a nuclear explosion by Lajos Gulacsi. And Gulacsi was a 20th century Hungarian painter. As you might imagine, he'd not paint this image because he died in 1932 before the Second World War. And another one is named hyper detailed sacred geometry render of a pastel wave on a glyphic mecha angel sculpture detailed architectural render 1970s Polaroid inspired by Wes Anderson's clip guided diffusion. So clip guided diffusion, this is an AI based uh, data driven generative model that produces these kind of images. And it's an instrument be be behind the, this growing art form that started off <laughs> just over six months ago. So very, very, very fresh. So we do not know where this is going, but I must say it looks much better than what AI art looked like three years ago with this Google Deep Dream and style transfer. So this somehow can look somehow original and fresh, but again, I'm not falling for it. Yeah, I do not, I'm not collapsing. I'm still trying to, to keep uh, me separate from the, the from, from, from comes from the mirror. So the images that are produced by this clip technique, they are pretty detailed. They have an exciting color palette and they look disturbingly realistic. They can be also of a high resolution. And the interesting thing is that the text, which this describes them, because text is not uh, just a caption that describes the image, text is actually what generates the image. So you provide the AI model with the text and as an output of the text, as an input, you get this super detailed image. Of course, it doesn't work all the time. You need to try many times. Depends also which words you use and in which combination and then this affects what comes out. And obviously some people have seen that and they are now practicing a lot trying to see what, how to put the words in which order and to end detailed as hell at the end and they get certain uh, you know, things. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's, 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 pl it's play. Like we humans, we are now playing. We are now just flirting with the re re reflection. We are not convinced yet. And some of the images also look very much arch like architectural renderings. And uh, what is interesting a little bit is how at the same time they look familiar and also quite alien to us. So one might even think that this kind of reminds us of uh, 
painters like uh, Francis Bacon, whose character also live on this kind of boundary between figuratively uh, being estranged and in this mysterious way. I'm not quite sure. And in the right context, also this relation between the text and the image can also be quite funny. And this is the image generated by the prompt. My kids drew a picture of Princess Zelda with crayons. It looks pretty bad, to be honest. So I find the, it's there is a place there for humor, which is much better. Um, so since the last year, I observed that this is so-called AI generative art is not only to be seen on Twitter. You can find it also is in public and self-hosted web galleries. And as you know, it's associated with so-called non-fungible tokens or NFTs which is a technology that allows them to be traded in uh, cryptocurrency markets. But we will get there later. So this is a web page owned by Katrin Krausen. She's an AI researcher, an artist known as Rivers Have Wings. So she's, I would say, quite successful in this. She uses the existing model to create the images, but she also kind of creates the models herself, custom models which are peculiar to her own style. Also, there's another random artist, as you can see, like it doesn't even matter anymore. The consistency of the images is more important than the, the artist is completely random. Yeah. Also, it, this technology has started to be used in also in 3D. So another AI researcher is developed this clip matrix model who is making this uh, kind of creatures uh, morphing from one texture to another and stuff like that. For me, what is important here, in order to keep the distinction between these two left side and right side, one side which wants to believe, another side which is skeptical, I want to ask, what am I actually looking at? How did we get here? How does this challenge us, perhaps architects? And where do we go from here? So, what am I looking at? First, as a thought experiment, uh, the question, is this thing an image? And if yes, in what sense it is an image? Because for thousands of years, an image, image meant something continuous in nature, something you could zoom up forever, and on each level, you will find new things to explore. Well, a digital image does not have that property. It's discrete. There's a hard limit imposed on it, which involves a suspension of disbelief. And this is a game where we pretend that the image on our computer is the same thing as something that can be seen outside of a computer. So this is this trick that computer graphics does. And what helps this trick is resolution. So the greater the resolution, the easier for us is to buy into this trick. So every digital image is nothing but a long list of values projected on a grid. Modern computer screen is a grid of tiny LED lights. An image printed on a printer is a grid of discrete marks, which means that living in a digital world means living in a discrete world where a numerical value is what is called an irreducible invariant, which eventually maps to streams of voltage and no voltage. So we, we have here, our, here a 28 by 28 pixels image, which has 784 pixels. And we can obviously show what the values are within these pixels. So each pixel is defined only by a single value here, representing its brightness. And the brightness levels are encoded within a range from zero to 255. And I visualized the values zero as white and uh, 255 as black, and the gray values are in between. So the screen, given this code, knows how to interpret it uh, based on these numbers. But of course, we can interpret this completely differently. Zero could be no brightness, and 255 could be maximum brightness. So it's a manner of a convention. So why am I no, uh, even saying this is a little bit trivial? So the notion of interpretation in the, in the digital world is in any way not natural. Digital always involves arbitrary conventions like this one. So what kind of interpretation does machine learning introduce to this picture? Well, in machine learning, to encode this image, we need to encode it in a so-called vector, matrix, or a tensor, depending on the model. So in the simplest case, we would do it uh, similarly, how the image is stored in computer's memory. So we would just flatten it into a very long list, going from top to bottom and left to right, or in some other order, if you wish. doesn't matter, as long as you just keep doing it always the same way. So, however, what is peculiar about machine learning in comparison to how this is done in a computer memory is how do we interpret these pixels? We interpret them in principle, on a meta level, we interpret them as dimensions. So each pixel of a digital image can be treated as a unique dimension of the image space. So when I say image space, I mean this grid of variables 
where each value can have any value between 0 and 255. So the grid of numerical values is a general approximator of any image. Yeah? And the approximation quality, of course, depends on the resolution of the grid. In this case, the grid has 784 dimensions. And the digit 5 is just a single point in 784 dimensional space. Now let's say that we have a typical big data scenario where we do not work with one image, but with one million images. This means that we have a distribution of different pixel values across all 784 dimensions. All of them vary yeah, freely between 0 and 255. Or we have much more if you have a larger image. Yeah? So these 1 million images, imagine now we have 1 million images, they have a particular shape in this high dimensional space. So what does this mean? So on the top left, you can see a 2D rendering of a normal distribution of ordinary numbers. So what the graph tells us is the data set, in this data set, there are more values around zero and less values as we go away from the zero. Yeah, Exponentially less as we go away. And this distribution is known as a normal distribution. So on the bottom, you see a similar shape, which characterizes the data where a single data point now on the bottom contains two values. One is x and one is y. Yeah. So we call such data points two-dimensional vectors. So to show their distribution, 2D distribution, we need to render it in a 3D space. So, so since 1 million images that we have, they have as many dimensions as we have pixels, in, the, in our case, 784. So you can also imagine that they too will have some kind of shape in this 784 dimensional space or any dimensional space. Yeah. Problem is we cannot visualize that shape at all. Yeah? We can visualize the shapes up to three dimensions, and then we cannot visualize them anymore. But we still must understand that this shape does exist. It doesn't mean that we, we do not have to see it for, for us to know that it exists. Yeah? So the most important thing to learn in this lecture, I think, at least for me, would be that the images that we humans consider to be meaningful or to make sense they form a very particular spatial distribution in the space of all possible images. The space of all possible images of a certain resolution is incredibly huge space. So what we humans perceive as familiar, meaningful, sensible, this takes just a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of this enormous, enormous space. This space itself is larger than the, the amount of atoms in our galaxy. If you don't believe me, you can try generating images by choosing random pixel values and see how often do you get a meaningful image. So just try randomizing each pixel, 0 to 255, and see how often do you get something meaningful. Never, basically, never. You just get noise. So what I want to say here is there is a unique geometric shape in high dimensional spaces, which corresponds well to our image perception. And the overwhelming majority of images sampled from the whole space is simply noise. Yeah. So there is just a tiny part which makes sense for us. So the second most important thing from this lecture would be that the whole idea of this AI-driven generative models, of these mirrors, is that they allow us to use actual images, like photographs, scans, drawings, 3D models, to derive a distribution of points in the space of all images that is very similar to the distribution of images which actually makes sense to us. Yeah. So it is kind of. This is exactly the mirror. It is able to find from this incredibly huge space a tiny portion, portion which looks the same as our own projection to the digital space. Yeah. So it's just a mirror, mirror, mirror mirroring it back. It found it. Yeah. So how are these models able to do this? They start uh, from a very random distribution of points in this space of all images, and they gradually start minimizing its distance to the actual distribution, which is actually present in the data. Yeah. And obviously, this require, requires a model like a neural network, which is just a very large, continuous, non-linear, differentiable uh, function with millions of parameters. And it also involves many computational tricks. But you as architects, obviously, you should not care about these tricks. I'll explain also why later. I think the most, one of the most critical concepts that we should care about is actually distilled on this slide, which is the method of minimizing an arbitrary function, because that's all a neural network is. So we have a function graphed as a green line. X is our inputs and Y is our outputs. So we want to know in which direction to move X, which is indicated at X old, such that its new position, which is X new, 
will have a lower output than x old. So we want the, the, the y to go to become less. And we are asking where to move x old to which new location to achieve this. Yeah. So the only thing that you need to know to do this, therefore, the only thing that you need for a neural network, basically, is a very simple thing, a mathematical concept of a derivative. You need to compute uh, uh, the derivative of this function and subtract it from the x old multiplied by a small number so that you could gradually move towards a lower point so that you could gradually make these two distributions closer to each other. So this random thing will start approaching the distribution which exists in your data. Yeah. And every neural network learns its parameters based on this principle. This is how the mirror becomes from a from a from a noisy mirror, it, it starts putting back meaningful things to us. Yeah. And then when you see this image, you should know that this image is engineered to appeal to you. So it is lying to you. It is seducing you. It is engineered to for you to like it. And you it's hard for you to say no to it. This is the part, tricky part. So the space of images that somehow make sense to our visual perception is very small and researchers can approximate it now. So we have it. We can now sample relatively meaningful images. And because this recreated distribution is not actually in identical to our visual perception, there are mismatches, there are fluctuations, there are errors. And because of these imperfections and the fact that we are mostly randomly sampling, we get something that appears to be familiar and at the same time alien to us. So this is the whole trick that this thing is playing playing back. Yeah. Let's quickly just explain how we got from here. So a little bit less speculation now. So we started from this Ian Goodfellow's first GAM paper. This was 2014. It took only eight years to, to reach the state-of-the-art open AI's glide model. So here I listed a sample of important AI generative modeling papers which were published in these eight years. So there's basically the majority of the good ones. I might have skipped some important ones, but yeah, problem with machine learning is that on average, we have 100 machine learning papers published every day. So literally no one can follow this development. And this is why I also don't recommend anyone to learn these models about in detail. We need to learn this principle that I showed you before, I think. So in a year, there will be a better model. So it pays off to be opportunistic in this space. Um, if you want, maybe it's not even important to know, but maybe I can show you how this actually works with these images that are created from uh, from the text prompts. I can maybe show, maybe I can spend three minutes to explain how this works. So many of you have showed, I mean, I heard using GANs. And let's just quickly say how GANs differ from the these diffusion models. So GAN, as you know, it's a neural network with a bunch of layers. So you sample some high, high dimensional noise, and then you get a noise vector. And you put the noise vector through a network. And then the network learns to generate nice pictures through what is called adversarial learning. Yeah. So two models which are fighting. So noise, what's the uh, source of noise? Uh, what's the deal with noise? Noise is a source of randomness. Yeah. So this is the left uh, picture. Yeah. On the Let's ex examine this one on the right. So uh, um, I don't see where I'm with the cursor. OK. So um, diffusion model on the right. So you have a data set. You take an image, for example, x1. x0, for example, is, is an image. This is the first thing that you have. Then you add a little bit of noise to it. Yeah. So noise in 2D, as I told you, noise in 2D is, has a two-dimensional shape. So it's just a tiny bit of uh, uh, normal distributed noise. Then you get a slightly noisier version of your image, which is x2, x1, actually. Then you add, add noise here as well, you get x2. So the first big idea of this process is if you did this many times, you start from an image, which is kind of an image that you start, and you end up with a noisy, with a noise, yeah, with a certain noise sample. Uh, this is an interesting idea because every image, when you start adding a random noise, will end up with a different distribution of noise. So each one will be different, it will not be the same noise, yeah. Although noise for us looks the same, it will not be the same noise. So the second big idea is involves learning because each subsequent layer is just a tiny bit blurrier and noisier than the previous layer. Then you can use a neural network here to predict x1 given x2. So you take a little bit noisier image and use it to predict a little bit less noisier image. Yeah. 
you use x2 to predict x1. Uh, but um, you do not do this directly. This will be too slow and hard. What you do, you predict the parameters of the noise that was added. And as you, as you know, the, 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 the normally distributed noise only has basically two parameters, mean and uh, standard deviation. Or in case of two-dimensional noise, it has something called a covariance matrix. But this is technicalities, doesn't matter. Basically, what happens is once you learn this, then you can something do something very nice. You start from a completely noisy image, randomly distributed random image, and go step by step predicting a less noisy version. And when you go back to the beginning, you get something which to humans appear to be meaningful. <laughs> you know, which is a little bit funny, yeah? Because this is what you did. You reached, this is how you made the mirror, and then the mirror looks back. What else can it do? Yeah. So this is how it works. I uh, hope I didn't talk too much about how it works. OK, he, this animation, I took it from a YouTube video by an artist named Nerdin Rodent to show you the steps that the network makes to start from a, sharp uh, from, from a noise image and then kind of sharpen up gradually. That's, that's how it goes. Obviously, at the end, you have something random. OK, now we have a simpler, better model than the GAN. But how do we use it to generate images? according to the text. So we need to attach to this model another model, which is called CLIP. And this is an exciting model, I think, because it learns how to correlate images and text. So what you, how you train it is you give it an input to an image, and you give it a caption. Yeah. So image and caption, image caption pairs. And you know that this is readily available across the internet and social media, because whenever you post an image, you write something about it, whatever it is. Yeah. It can be whatever, however you want to write about it. If, it's a hashtag, is it some nonsense? If it's something descriptive, it doesn't matter. The model doesn't care, yeah? So then how you evaluate it, you do not have like labels and then the network is actually not correct. The network needs to get uh, to evaluate anything. It needs to get two things. It needs to get uh, an image and it needs to get a sample of certain texts. And the only thing it can tell you, which of these texts is most uh, likely connected to it. So it does not know the label of this. It doesn't know what it is, but it knows that this text is closest to it without have, having any idea of the meaning. Yeah? So the meaning is kind of implicit. So the text which is closest here is a photo of guacamole, a type of food. OK, so how do you then make this uh, text guide the generation? Well, we use two models interchangeably. You take a noisy image. yeah, You plug it into this clip model together with its caption. And then the clip tells you the measure of how well they match. And at the beginning, that's going to be very bad because you have a noisy image and text. And the model does not know how well they match. It will, it will then actually say randomly, like how well it matched. It's going to be a random value. But then with, with the neural networks, the interesting thing is that with this gradient, you can reverse the question. So you can now ask the clip model, yeah, I know it doesn't match. But tell me a direction toward, towards which to go in order to match it better. So it doesn't know uh, why. Uh, it says, yeah, it doesn't match. To, but the only thing it knows is in which direction to go to make it match better. And it gives you this dimension, uh, this, give you this thing called a gradient. And then you take the noisy image together with a gradient. You concatenate them together, put them in the same vector, and plug them into this diffusion model to predict a sharp, sharp image. So the overall idea, you, take, you give a model a noisy image and this clip gradient, which is telling you in which direction to go to make a image closer to its description. And then you ask the diffusion model to predict the sharper image. And if you do this in many layers at the same time, when the learning is finished, um, what you can do is you now start with giving the model just a completely noisy image and a prompt, text prompt. And in several iterations, this, uh, this transformation is guided such that the final image will closely resemble the text. And as you can see, these are the state of the art results here. Surrealist, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but surrealist dreamlike oil painting by Salvador Dali of a cat playing checkers, a professional photo of a sunset behind, blah, blah, blah. high quality oil painting of a psychedelic hamster. So this is what it is able to do by with only the, obviously not only, there's nothing only here, I will explain later. So this is the fascination that we have. This is the state of the art that people are getting crazy about. OK, that's how it works. That's what it is. That's what we are looking at. 
Um, all right. Thing is, if we know how it works, if we know the, how the mirror is constructed, we can ask how does the mirror challenges. And let's now examine a little bit, this is a little bit maybe dry, but let's examine the actual dynamics of the, this AI generative art scene. It took me a little bit of time to figure out things there. So on one side, you have these well-paid competitive AI researchers, they create the models. They work for companies with unlimited resources like Google, Facebook, NVIDIA, OpenAI. And these companies are the ones that can afford to collect and if even needed, they can label an enormous amount of data. And we do not even have to mention that some of them even have a monopoly on image data, which is stored on their server. So everything is theirs. They also have unbelievable computing infrastructure to do these experiments very efficiently. And if you are an AI literate architect with an ordinary computer or even extraordinary one, you cannot do absolutely none of this. It's out of your reach. We are out of this game, yeah? So what we can do instead. So the authors, usually they give us trained model and they give us the code to explore, to produce the images, yeah? And then what AI artists do, they provide a textual input. Perhaps they start with a certain blurry image to guide it. They believe it's gonna go somewhere. And the model is actually outputting the artwork. Yeah, they publish it and they hopefully then sell it for cryptocurrencies as NTFs. So the role of an AI artist is to literally sift through this vast data space and try to find something attractive. And if they are successful, they get paid by other people for their findings. And their art is simply about curating their exploration through the existing models. So it's a very bizarre economy taking shape. The source of value then is on one side in these huge companies which create these models. On the other side, the source of value is having good taste, knowing how to curate things, having proper marketing, having a persona which wraps it all up. And this is how it goes with um, generative art. For architects, I would say right now, this setup is too simple. Architecture is not obviously only about images and uh, it's about orchestrating things which are of different spatial and temporal natures. And the crucial problem with all this automatic generation is that the model has the final say in the process. So what we are missing, among other things, are infinitely things that we're missing, but we're missing policy, we're missing politics. Intentionality and directionality, they're completely limited. So the whole universe is created by those who made the model and selected the data. Yeah. Again, we are architects are falling for the same trap when they made the CAD tools and say, yeah, learn how to use CAD tools. So the ontology is given, and then the <laughs> instead of, uh, uh, you creating, you directing the model or programming the model, model programs you. AutoCAD programs you to work in an AutoCAD manner and you become an AutoCAD follower. And then you will see design through an AutoCAD. This is how you see design will be affect your idea of how you design, how you work will be affected by this ontology of the tool this is given to you. Again, we are there with, with, uh, with this mirror. This mirror completely brings us back there, in my opinion. So the whole universe is created by those who make the model and selected the data. And what you will find there is entirely determined by the data. You only are given the means to explore. So these models gives us maps that are huge, but inherently closed. They do not contain any future architecture. And the sheer size provides us with an illusion of openness. The question is who compiled the data set? What's in it? What is not? And who decides? It would be great if we could decide as individual architects and take full responsibility for our decisions. But unfortunately, we do not have the means. We are just the explorers again. And my concerns here are not only about the biases or safety. I'm not complaining that someone will use StyleGAN of GPT model to create fake images and fake news. That's not what I'm saying. This is of course also a bad thing, but yeah. I'm just pointing out to something a little bit less flashy, but a little bit depressing for architects. I think these models offer big tech companies a basis for an excellent business model. So they do not have to study architecture for years to work internships, care about the field, talk about architecture, write about it, discuss with your friends, play, create public discourse. Yet they will be maybe able to provide outputs, which on terms of fidelity are on par what an architect can do. And it's also much easier for them to do this because they already have the infrastructure and resources to produce data for this purpose. So the mirror just needs to mirror back to you. This is what they're counting on. And if one day they succeed to do this, and I think they can succeed if we do not think about it at all, 
then I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping that this will not happen, but it might happen that they could find the target in the market with some generic automated architecture. And that if we are not able to compete with this, we are might be in a problem because no architect can sell projects for a price that is computed by a machine learning algorithm automatically by using our likes and comments from social media to guide what we might like or not. Obviously, this might not be ending up a be a problem, but I'm concerned about it nevertheless. And the last question is up for discussion. My goal is also not to tell you what to do, but to inspire you to think about this topic. My um, general attitude is that we should use AI to make architecture more compelling, interesting, and exciting, but not to use it as a final destination, not to use it as a creative, uh, as something whose output is a creation. Yeah. So we should not, if we use it for architecture, we should not use it to make architecture more efficient, more optimized, more functional, more common sense. Optimization is something that machines do much better than us. And AI is also pretty good with common sense. And as uh, Luger Horstadt would say, our job as architects is about jointing, contracting, attracting, lighting, texturing, animating, communicating, storytelling, branding. So uh, one thing which kind of gives me hope, perhaps naively, uh, is that AI models also fail a lot, which is not always showcased in these, in these presentations. So even the most advanced glide model simply cannot make cars wheels triangular. Yeah? Even uh, the prompt is a car with triangular wheels it simply cannot do that because it's something that does not exist in our images, because it is useless. It doesn't make sense, yeah? A triangle wheel would be something that we would consider an outlier, yeah? And we would be asking the model to predict an outlier, and this is completely insane, because AI models are not used to predict the outlier. We, when we use machine learning, we get rid of outliers, we predict the mean, yeah? So there is a discrepancy between architecture and AI. Because architecture for me is all about outliers. They are unique points that we always come back to. They are things that do not communicate with the rest of the world. They are alone. They are, they are we do not know how to relate them to anything. That's why they're masterpieces. I think there's a very nice text by Gertrude Stein, what are masterpieces and why there are so few of them. This is very beautiful to understand this point. And um, what is valuable, what is novel is also intrinsically rare and does not exist in data, which is why we cannot predict it. If you want to know more, maybe check out my video on AI and mastership. I, I made a technical account of why AI and architecture are orthogonal to each other. And I try to prove it mathematically, which is a little bit weird, but maybe interesting. In this regard, I even find that these non-traditional, non-AI generative models, they have a, even an advantage and significant role to play because they can produce things that we have never thought before or never even consider. This image shows the work of my ex-colleague, uh, Michael Kanzmeier. He, he uses subdivision modeling, which is kind of a very simple technique as a means of producing spaces that we cannot draw or model by hand. But sometimes it just works. Sometimes th th this is for me showing you what architecture is about because sometimes even that crazy algorithm, sometimes is the perfect thing to be there. Yeah, And this is paradoxical. So this, this is a grotto set designed for uh, Monsters Opera at the Magic Flute. And uh, the most prominent opponents of pre-AI generative modeling, they were always complaining about that the design space was too large and too full of nonsense. For me, this unknown space that we create ourselves is even more likely where the mastership will come from than from AI. Yeah, if, uh, when AI dumps seem to work, this is maybe an example, maybe I will skip it. The idea is when, even if you have this kind of generative approaches, sometimes even if you introduce a decision-making in a kind of certain stages, when you do not just create one picture all of, at the same time, but when you make a kind of discrete steps, when you decide one thing and the next thing and see when something, something fits in context, it might work better. And this, this is a kind of promising approach for me. Obviously it's not promising in this exactly, in this way, because this is too primitive for me to like, okay, fill this with a painting of, uh, 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 around coffee table and in front of a couch, and then you see exactly that, yeah? This is a little bit too simple, but this idea, maybe not so bad, I think. This kind of search, searching for an answer is maybe more interesting than just going to full automation. 
Finally, what is my uh, idea? How I, do I approach even if I need to research something? How do I, how do I know where to go even? My position is uh, there's a great promise in embracing abstraction. This same abstraction which uh, made AI possible, but this I think requires a new literacy. And this table, this is one of, for me, the most significant theoretical outcomes of my PhD because it serves me like a research compass. So I always try to be exploring the notions on the right side of the table, which pertain to the quantum information world, because I believe the ones on the left side pertaining to modernity might be behind us. So in principle, when I'm thinking about things, I have a couple of these kind of, I call them compasses, like the one that you see so before when I made a distinction between left and right and trying to push them separate and saying that it's, this thing is actually a mirror if you, you know, by breaking the distinction, you, you are mirroring. Here, the right side is just the certain notions that th throughout my research I found maybe are more adequate things to, to see whether, at least for me, to see if I'm on the at least right path in a certain way, I try to see, am I closer to the right side or to the left? Maybe it's a naive thing, but at least that's how I work. So that's it for today. Sorry, it was a little bit long, but uh, thanks a lot. Thank you.